Hello and welcome to Storytelling and Bringing Stories to Life in Your Home. Hello and welcome to Storytelling and Bringing Stories to Life in Your Home. I'm Natasha and I'm from Telltale Heart and I'm going to be sharing with you some techniques on how to bring stories to life in your home. And I'd like to thank you all for joining me this afternoon and just say how grateful I am to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. So this is the first of my storytelling sessions and each session I'm going to be focusing on a different story from a different part of the world and a different technique of storytelling that you can use at home with your child or with your children. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit, I am Natasha and I'm from a performer actress background. Um, I trained in physical theatre and also in storytelling using Eastern theatre styles and mixing them with Western theatre styles. So I trained in things like Katakali and Indian dance and Beijing opera and looked at ways at how these could be put together with different Western ways of telling stories like maybe puppetry or mask work and also storytelling. Um, and I say that because, you know, all cultures have their own history of storytelling, their own oral tradition of how stories have been told going back centuries. And, um, and I think it's, it's wonderful to know that the heritage of that is expansive. So um, I also run Telltale Hearts, which you can check out the link as part of the, the links at the bottom of the handout if you want to find out more about the history of Telltale Hearts and my background. But basically I've been making theatre and sharing stories with young children for well over 15 years. And uh, as a practitioner, um, I've worked with an awful lot of children, but also as a parent, I've benefited from using some of those things with my own children in the home. So I'm going to be sharing some of those with you as part of these sessions and hopefully having some fun as well. So just to start off with, I wanted to ask the question of what is storytelling? And I just want you to take a moment to think if you want, you can write it on a piece of paper. You don't have to share it with me, but if you have a device that you want to write it down, just share what you think storytelling is. Do you want me to play the video? No. That's great. So you've had a little bit of a think of what you think storytelling is. And I'll just share with you some of the things that for me storytelling is about. So I came across a fantastic quote, the art form of painting pictures with your tongue. And for me, that really encapsulates what storytelling is, the art of painting pictures with your words, with your tongue. Um, Storytelling is also the interactive art of using words and actions to reveal the elements and images of a story while encouraging the listener's imagination. And I think that's the really key important part of storytelling is that it is working with the listener's imagination and the imagination is so active. And for each child or for each person listening, that is hugely individual. So unlike in theatre or in television or animation, you don't have a set, you don't have, um, you don't have uh, a, a huge visual backdrop. The completed story happens in the mind of the listener. And as I said, it's unique to each child or each person listening. And in that way, the listener becomes part of the co-creator of the story. So there is an engagement between that storyteller and the person listening to that story. And in all my years of experience of 
of doing stories in libraries, in theatres, outside, in festivals, in all manner of different places, that connection with the children or with the audience is always different and always unique to that particular group of children at that particular time. And I think that's one of the really special things about, about storytelling. So how do you get children interested in stories? I thought I'd break it down just for this first session into a few really simple things <clears throat> and the first thing is to make sure that you've got a comfortable space and for some people that might be having like a story den or a story corner <clears throat> somewhere where you've got comfortable cushions you can get nice and cozy and comfy together or it might be part of your bedtime routine. It might be part of cozying down into bed. But something about the intimacy of sharing stories that also lends itself to having that intimate, cozy space. Um, and secondly, I would say it's about building anticipation of a story for your child. How can you build that excitement and anticipation that comes with a story and what you're going to find out? So what kind of kind of routine or ritual might you be able to build up around sharing a story that helps build that anticipation? And if you think of routines as part of child development, they are a huge way in which we help children make sense of the world and make sense of getting ready for bed, whether it's brushing teeth or preparing for a meal and getting ready for dinner time. And the same is true for stories. So one of the things we're gonna focus on is how you can create that ritual, that routine to help enrich children's expectation for story time. And the third thing is how you can get your child involved. How can your child become part of that co-creator of the story and we're going to look at different ways in which you can get your child to be part of that co-creation of a story a story that might be written or a story that might be a myth but ways that you can bring your child into that story so these things i'm talking about they sound quite abstract don't they and what I thought would make it easier is if we looked at those things, but looked at it through the lens of a story. So shortly, I'm going to ask for a video to be played of um, one story from Suitcase Stories, which is a touring show that I've toured around for many years, where the stories come out of a suitcase. Um, and during this horrendous COVID situation during lockdown where we weren't allowed to go anywhere, I recorded each individual story with the help of, um, of my family just outside so that I could share the stories with people who weren't able to get to a theatre or get to a library or get to school. Um, and I'm going to share the first of these stories with you. But before I ask it to be played, I want you to watch this story and this story is a Yorkshire tale I want you to watch it and I want you to look for though for three things so firstly I want you to look at how I use ritual to build children's expectation for the story so look for the ways that I do it in this video secondly how do I encourage children to get involved Watch the video and see the different ways that I get the children to be involved. If you want, you can make your notes, but you don't have to. I just want you to watch and see if you can pick them up. And the third thing, I want you to focus on how I use my voice. What different ways do I use my voice that encourages the child's imaginative participation? So, those are the three things. How I use ritual, how I encourage children to join in, and three, the different ways that I use my voice. Because this story is in some ways the most traditional in that I, I simply use my voice to tell it with, well, with a few gestures as well, but that's next week's theme. So without further ado, 
let's watch the story of a Yorkshire tale. If you could play the video for me, please. Thank you. Hello. You see, I have travelled all over the world. And as I've travelled, I've collected stories. <laughs> but as I'm not allowed to travel at the moment, not even on my flying carpet, I thought I might share some of my stories with you this afternoon. So um, this first story, well, Let's find out where it comes from, shall we? Let's have a look inside my special magic case. Ooh. Oh yes! <laughs> well I might have travelled far but this, this comes from very close to my home. In fact, this was given to me by a lady I met just down the road in Ilkley and uh, well, she told me a story about a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of hers, which means it must be true, isn't it? And this friend of hers, well, he was an old man and he had a white bushy beard and a little bit of a belly. Some people said that he looked a little bit like Father Christmas. I'm not saying it was Father Christmas, he just looked a bit like that and um, he used to like to uh, well see if you can guess what he liked to do he liked to that's right he used to like walking and one morning he and he saw the sun had just started to rise above the Yorkshire moors and he said to himself, today is a great day for walking. And he went downstairs and he put on his wellies and he opened the door and he set off for a walk. He walked for miles. Until he got to the highest point of those Yorkshire moors and then he sat himself down and he tucked into his cheese and pickle sandwich and um, a pickled gherkin. And as he sat there eating his sandwich, he started to hear some music. Where do you think that music could have been coming from on the moors? Maybe it was from a brass band or could it have been an ice cream van? Huh? Well, he looked to see if he could see a brass band or even a strange looking woman like me around, but he could see no one until he looked down and there fluttering above the purple heather were a group of fairies. Do you want to make a fairy like mine? See if you can get your hands away from you and then turn the palms so that they face you. And then can you make a giant cross like an X on a treasure map? And then see if you can get your thumbs to have a hug. 
and then you can turn your hands into the wings of the fairy and as they were flying they were singing do you think you could join in with me da, da, dum, ba, da, da, dum, ba, dum, ba, da, da, dum. And as they were flying, they were dancing up high in the sky. Can you join in with me? Oh, well, the old man, just like you, he got really excited and he joined right in. And those poor fairies, they got so scared that they just flew off and hid. Can you hide your fairies? Hmm? Some fairies hid underneath the rocks. Some hid underneath the heather. And one tiny little fairy hid underneath the old man's beard. Do you think that was a good place for a fairy to hide? Hmm? The old man could feel the fairy's tiny wings tickling his chin. <laughs> and so very carefully, he reached in and he took out the fairy. And then he did a very naughty thing. What do you think he did? He put the fairy into his pocket so that he could show his grandchildren what he had found when he got home. And then he went home as fast as his old legs could carry him. When he got home, he gathered his grandchildren around. <laughs> That's right, a bit like you are now, yes. Wait till you see what I've got, he said. And then he reached into his pocket. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. Hey, up. Hey, up. What's going off? Because the fairy was gone and all that was left was And that's the first of my stories from Suitcase Stories. And if you've enjoyed it, you can give us a like and then maybe I'll share some more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that, hello again. So that was the first of the stories from Suitcase Stories. And it is a traditional tale from Yorkshire, which is close to where I live. Um, so did you notice those different things? how I set up a ritual, a little routine, did you notice how I used that rhyme repetitively to kind of to build up the tension when opening the suitcase and also there is nothing more exciting for young children than knowing what is inside a case. They always love to know. And you'll see each week how I use that case to reveal items that then go on to help tell the story. So having a very simple rhyme can be a really great way of building up a little routine or a little ritual around, around story time. And in, actually in a lot of languages there's quite often a linguistic way of once upon a time that's in English but I'm sure every culture has a different way of doing that we'll have a little look at that a little bit later so secondly in that Yorkshire tale how did it what was the second point was how did I encourage children to get involved that was very much that conversational tone, wasn't it? And the open questions, um, where might that music be coming from? And 
a child's answer helps me to know how much the child has gone into that imaginative world with me. How much are they actually on that hillside with the old man looking at that scenery or how much are they still in their world where what who they might see might be um someone close to them might be somebody in their family or it might be somebody even more immediate might be me itself but it gives me a little bit of a clue to see how much they are on that hillside with me how much they've been able to imaginatively come with me at that part of the story and also giving them the opportunity to create their own fairies as part of that story um, oh it's also if you do have questions for me you can put them in the chat box and we'll do the q a session at the at the end of the at the end of the session but if you have got a question that crops up during you can put it in that chat box and i'll have a look at it towards the end i forgot to mention that in my beginning so thirdly what we were looking at was the different ways that i use my voice so I used my voice to create the old man. He had an accent, didn't he? Um, but I also used it with the abstract sound. So when he was walking, <laughs> and when the fairies were hiding, <laughs> and it's really important, I think, to be able to use those abstract sounds, the non-verbal sounds, because it's part of children's language acquisition that they use sounds and the sound of things all the time. But it's also a way in which you can build up a rhythm as part of the story, as part of the story too. Um, so, uh, yeah, which comes into building up the tension or building up a climax like when the old man ran home <laughs> with a, so it's also how you can build that climax up so if you like you are very welcome to um, view the video again once the webinar is on the um, Bright Star website, you'd be able to watch the video again and you could watch it with your children. And how might you be able to maximize your child or your children's enjoyment of that story? And I think it's so important being able to have these experiences together. And that's one of the beauties of when I do share stories live is that I'm sharing them for families. And part of that interaction is not just with the child, but is also with the parent too. So the most important thing that you can that you can do for your child is to role model that interest um, and to ensure that you've not got those kind of phone distractions. But allow yourself to get absorbed in that story too because your your child is watching you to know what you see as being worthy of your attention so if you think that the story is worth listening to then they're going to want to listen to it too um, and secondly is how you can support those questions ask them you know you can pause the video as well what do you think might be making that music there you can pause the video ask your child what do you think or also ask them what you think about what he does about placing the fairy in his pocket that's a key moment was that the right thing to do or not ask your child um and when it comes to showing your fairy join in with it make your fairy alongside your child it's quite often tricky actually in getting the hands the right way around so it doesn't matter if they make their fairy this way around or if they make their fairy that way around it really doesn't matter but what is important is that you enjoy making that fairy too and you enjoy that fairy dancing in the sky and join in the little rhythm da -dum, ba -da -da -dum. doesn't matter if it's in tune or not it's wonderful vocal play and it's again it's another opportunity to share that experience with your child and if you want to extend the activity after the story here are just a few ideas for how you might want to extend that activity you could 
continue the idea of taking your fairy on a journey. You might take your fairy on a journey over the desert or through the palm trees. Can it go round the house and maybe around parts of your furniture as palm trees? Can it go under the sea? Yeah, can you take your fairy on a journey into the bathroom maybe? Or just around so that it's going underneath things as well as over things as well as through things um and secondly could does your child want to invent their own fairy might be a sand fairy or a palm fairy they might want to draw their fairy or they might want to just think of adventures that their fairy might go on they might want to make their fairy or they might have already a toy or, or something that they want to already see as being a sand fairy or the fairy of their invention. And you could also get your child to hide the fairy. Where might your child want to hide that you have to come and find them? They could use the sound or they could find different ways of hiding um, and you sneaking to try and find where the fairy might be hidden. So those are just a few ideas of how you can extend the story activity in your, in your home afterwards. Um, so let's get back to some of those um, storytelling techniques. I'm not expecting all of you to necessarily want to share all of your stories orally. You might want to share your stories that are books, and that's just as valid but one wonderful thing to be able to do with books is also to be able to pause your story and ask those open-ended questions so all of these techniques that we're looking at through oral storytelling are just as valid when you're sharing a story or a storybook with your child so i just wanted to come back to that first one about how you introduce ritual and how you build up that anticipation. Um, and I mentioned that in different languages, there are quite often different ways in which you introduce a story. So I happen to know in, in Danish, if, any, if I have any Danish speakers there, forgive my, forgive my accent, but even if you don't understand Danish, it, it doesn't matter because you'll, you'll hear how this works. So in Denmark, stories, whether it's reading a story at home or sharing a story with, with children, they're often start, started with Ela bela nu skal ye fortelle. So Ela bela nu skal ye fortelle. Now I'm going to tell you. And the way in which the story is ended is with Snip snap schnuller, nu er den historia ule which is snip snap schnuller, nu eden historia ule. And now is the story over. But that snip snap schnuller is like the sound of the closing of the book. And it's a wonderful onomatopoeia way of building up that, ooh, now I'm going to tell the story and now the story is finished. So I am sure that you have in your language wonderful ways of being able to introduce story and kind of wrap that story up and I just think those are really exquisite ways of, of being able to top and tail that story expectation so that's kind of what I mean by setting up that ritual or that routine but you can also do it visually so if you wanted you could make up your own ritual for how you start that so it might be one two three time for a story mm -hmm. which is uh, just one that i that i made up in in english so you can make your own or you can have you might want to use an instrument as part of it so you might want to story time story time story time so these are just a few examples of ways that you can introduce a story and build that excitement or anticipation for it to get ready for it. Um, 
So, um, when you are, again, when you are reading, it's finding the opportunity for when you can ask those questions. A great question might be, you know, how is a character feeling at a particular point in the story? Ooh, how does that character feel? Um, and pictures are often a fantastic way of being able to help with that. Or can you join in some of the actions? In a story like The Hungry Caterpillar, for example, you could use your finger as the caterpillar crawling along and maybe it crawls onto your child and you could make your voice do the sounds of the caterpillar as it crawls along and that's something again that you can both do together and then thirdly how you use your voice so if you've got different characters in your storybook you can try a different accent for a particular character or you could um, try doing some of the abstract sounds. Again, if we go back to that caterpillar, when it's eating through the different fruit, it's a wonderful way of reinforcing context to be able to bring your voice to create some of the imaginative, well, what it does is it helps the, the imagination of the child to invest in what is taking place at, in that key event in that story. And the pictures help that too, but so does the sound that you might be able to bring with it. So uh, we're coming to our set task. So these set tasks are entirely optional um, but if you want to embed some more of the, the learning and just have a practice at it then I highly recommend that you give these tasks a go. So suggested task for this week is to come up with your own routine for story time whether that be with a musical instrument or whether it be with a you might even want to play a little piece of recorded music as part of it to kind of um, build the anticipation. Actually, I was really enjoying the classical music that was building up to the start of this webinar. And I was thinking, oh gosh, that's fantastic for these fairies to have that classical music. So even that is a fantastic way to build up that anticipation. Or you might want to, if you want, you can use my example, which is, um, and I will show you, I've, I've done this with, um, with a scarf, because I'm quite sure that you'll have um, a scarf at home, but you could have one, two, three, time for a story. What will it be? A story for you and me. This story is going to be the magic paintbrush. <clears throat> Are you sitting snug? Then let's begin. So if you want, you are very welcome to use that or come up with your own little routine. Might be that you just want to use the, the scarf for story time. It really doesn't have to be a big deal, but it's something that that sets the tone and sets the anticipation and that excitement and that kind of playful spirit. So that's the first task that would be fantastic if you gave that a go before next week when I'm back. And the second thing is just to try out some of those techniques that I've just been talking about from the Yorkshire Tale, try out different ways of um, using your voice when reading out a story. Can you find a section in your story where you can use some playful abstract sound, maybe as a soundscape, you know, as part of the walking or part of the event? Can you use the, there's wind, can you create a little bit of that soundscape? And can you change your voice to maybe make an accent for a different character? It doesn't have to be an accent, it might be a change in pitch. So you might have a very high speaking 
character or like the old man a very low speaking character who speaks down here um, so it doesn't have to be accent it could be like i said that change in pitch but have a go and have some fun and there's really no way to get this wrong it's just try and see what see what fun you can have with it so that's that's pretty much what i've got to share for you for this first webinar session next week i'm going to be looking more at language and how language relates to physical gesture I and mean, i'm sure you saw it there in use in the yorkshire tale as well but we're going to look at a story from west africa the fisherman and the ring and we'll look at precisely how language and gesture match and how you can encourage language language acquisition through physical gesture and how physical gesture can enhance the story so that's what we'll be looking at next week and in the meantime before we finish it's the important time of having chance to look at your questions so if you have any questions for me for any of the things that i've um, brought to your attention through this webinar then now is your time you can put it in the chat box and I will check out the chat box or in the Q&A section. And um, if you want to raise a hand and raise your question through the microphone, that's also possible, but probably easiest to do it through that chat box. So if you want to type in a question, that would be fantastic. And I can see something sitting in the chat box. So I'll have a look. Oh, Thank you, Hessa. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that story. <laughs> and I'm sorry for the wind across the microphone, but we didn't have a film crew, unfortunately, as part of the filming of that story. But I hope that you could see enough of the techniques on display to see how, um, how they, they work, even when you didn't get the, the opportunity to see how I interacted with, with other children. So whilst we wait for perhaps one or two of your questions to come through the chat box, I thought I'd just share a few things that parents often ask me after the stories. And one of those is, what age, you know, when should I start reading stories or sharing stories for my child? What age is the most appropriate? And, um, and I think a good answer to that is that there are, there are storybooks that are made that are pitched towards the different development of children. And it's really helpful to try and get the right book for the right age and the right stage in development. So from the off, the tactile books that you can give to a really young infant that's in the mode of exploration and is exploring things through the mouth and through the fingers and tactile books are wonderful ways for them to have different textures that they can explore and they might have holes in it they might have things that they can poke through they are wonderful ways for very as i say for infants to be able to already start exploring books and as they start getting older i think from 18 months um well from one year you can start already with starting story time as part of your as part of your routine and sharing stories together um, the, the more you do it and the earlier you start the easier it is to build that rapport up and i think another useful thing certainly um, that i discovered as a parent especially if you've got a very treasured picture book and you're giving to giving the picture book to them too early and it starts to get ripped and is to keep um to give a sense of preciousness to that book and a sense of place and that's in a way what ritual does as well it endows the book with having kind of a special magical quality that you can you know that's going to be 
a time for you to share with your child and that preciousness comes from the fact that you're handling the book and they're handling the book safely with you um, and as I say sharing and exploring those those stories and come sort of three three and a half is when they are really absorbing making all of those different connections and stories are absolutely key for that stage in their development um, but the more that you've been doing it in the build up to that, then the easier it is for them to really seize that, that all those brain connections going, making all of those connections between things. And you'll see that they'll spot more in the pictures than you might in terms of what the subtext to a story might be. So that's one question I often get asked and I can see that whilst I've been doing that, I've got another question. Do you recommend to tell a story with one chartiers is that with one um with one i'm not sure what chartiers is is that um are you okay just to explain what a chartier is or it might be a typo see uh, beside uh, next to q a it's a bubble said chat click on the chat Where is the share screen? It says share screen. Share screen? Yes. Yeah. Do you see where it's next to it? It's a chat, a bubble says chat. Chat, yeah, I've got the chat box. Okay, click on that. And then... Oh, chapter. Sorry, I've seen it. Yes. Okay. A chapter, a short story. Oh, yes. Oh, what? that's a fantastic question. Yes, I totally recommend to share a chapter. What a fantastic question. Absolutely. Sharing a chapter and evening is a wonderful way of building up that anticipation. And also that they can't have all the answers at once. It's really difficult for, for children to, when they want all of the answers at once and they want to know everything all at once, <gasps> to have to wait. But it's also, it's a fantastic way of, building up that that skill to be able to wait and anticipate and look forward to something so important so yes i highly recommend doing one chapter at a time over you know one chapter perhaps one day the next chapter the next day doing it in stages like that is brilliant and it also helps the story to sit with them for a bit too so they might be asking questions in between. I think that's an excellent idea. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I have um, I have another question that I often get asked. Whilst maybe some of you are thinking of another question for me. Um, my child doesn't pay attention for the whole story. So how can I help my child to pay attention more? And I think the answer to this is one of the things is about, again, that focus that, that you give it. If it's an outside person telling a story, it's the focus that you give that. If it's a story that you're sharing with your child and they don't seem to be giving it the attention that you would like them to, it might be because they are in, you know, something else is happening for them right at that time and it might not be the best time which is why it's helpful to build a routine um, around that story time because it helps them to build the expectation of oh this is the time when we're going to be still actually this is a time in which we're going to enjoy the story together and the other thing is repeating that routine it might not work the first time it might not work so brilliantly the second time either but by repeating the third and fourth and that expectation of focus and giving the attention to the story starts to become a habit and with that their attention stays for longer and they start to absorb more oh the imaginative game that's going on because not all children i mean it's a bit of a myth isn't it that all children have wonderful imaginations imagination is something that needs developing like language um, like all forms of child development and 
you can't expect necessarily that the imagination is the same for all children so it's taking those little steps to help develop that imaginative engagement um, and the other thing is sharing stories that they might have an interest in so if you know that your child is really into vehicles or lorries then having a story that might have a train or, or a lorry as a key character in it would be a very good idea or if it's dinosaurs have a storybook that's around dinosaurs so try and link into their interests for what those stories might be i think that's really really helpful um and you know it's also true that not all children love the same book <laughs> as well so one one story might work fantastically for one child and it might not work so well for another and i'm sure you will discover or already know your children's favorites and quite often they want those favorites repeated again and again because there's something so safe and comforting about um experiencing that same story and the way in which you you tell it and enhance it so don't worry if it's your if your child is asking again and again for the same story. Maybe you can do it that we'll have that story, we'll do that story tomorrow night, but maybe the night after we'll have a new one just to try um, and open up the um, the range of stories they they might want to um, hear or um, be part of. Um, oh, and I've spotted another question. Great shall we focus on story with more than one characters again that's a really good question y yes absolutely and i think it's really helpful there if um again if you use if you use your voice to help distinguish different characters often if you're getting an age appropriate book they will have um a, they will have a limited number of characters that are part of that story and each character will be introduced in quite a key way as part of that story so how you introduce a new character in the story can be a fun thing you don't have to create a voice for every single character but actually if you think of all the different ways you can use your voice by speaking slowly for a particular character or even speaking quite quickly and changing the pitch and then playing with accent there are a whole range of different ways that you can characterize different characters so yes i think it's great to introduce children to different characters in a story but think um of how you can introduce those characters when it's that part of the of the story i hope that answers your question there and one more question that um i quite often get asked by parents is um oh i think i might have i think i might have answered that is is um what book should i be reading um for my children and again that's where i was talking about those kind of those books that can reflect the interests of your child so if your child is really interested in in dinosaurs or is really interested in other cultures or is interested in in fairies um then you can pick a picture book or a story book or a chapter book that has um, elements of those that they already have an interest in. And like I said, most books tend to have an age guide. Um, and this is very much a sort of generalization because all children develop at different rates. So it can be that you could say that a book that's for sort of two to three year olds might appeal to some four to five year olds. And you might have some books that are sort of five to six that might appeal to you know a three-year-old there is a difference and you will know your child best to know what um i guess how interested in in books and and stories they are because that developmental stage comes at different times for different children um and i think the most important thing is is having um um, stories that appeal to them at that stage so some children 
maybe the picture books they've grown out of and they're looking at those chapter books you know that question about and having a chapter each um each day or each evening and is another really key thing i think is it's very easy because children aren't able very young children aren't able to always express their ideas and their understanding with language because their language ability isn't at the same level as their capacity to understand. They're sometimes, um, sometimes I think adults um, underestimate how intellectually um, adept young children often are and they can understand far more than we give them credit for. So it's marrying up the right content that engages them intellectually as well with the actual content of that of that book. Um, so I, I hope that helps. So try not to underestimate what their understanding might be is I guess what I'm saying, but I'm quite sure that you don't underestimate your children or they'd be very quick to put you right on that one. Um, so that's the end of our question and answer session. If there are any questions that I might have missed, then we will catch them up and put them in, post them in the webinar that gets posted onto the Bright Start um, website. And just a reminder that I will be back next week, same time for storytelling, bringing stories to life in your home for the next stage when we'll be looking particularly at physical gesture and how that marries up with language. Um, and looking at how we can encourage sort of language acquisition. There's a tongue twister. I'm glad I, I'm glad I got my tongue around that one. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And um, I wish you wonderful time in sharing stories and having story time with your child or with your children. Thank you.